Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Florka. I'm the Bakerpedia Baked and Science podcast host, and I am a baker influencer. Today on this Baker Inn, I'm going to talk to you about using a texture analyzer for helping to evaluate your shelf life. Now, this is not shelf life for mold growth. This is shelf life for texture. So let's dive right into it because we've got lots to cover. So what we just saw there is the texture analyzer instrument penetrating a double slice of white bread to measure the texture of how firm or how soft it is. And I'll get into a little bit more of the details of what we saw with that graph yet as well. This video has been made possible by Texture Technologies Corporation. You can peruse the instrument's probes, attachments, and application studies online at texturetechnologies.com. I want to thank Texture Technologies for their generous support and providing me with the loan of an instrument to capture processes and data for this video, as well as a full day of on-site technical support, which significantly improved my working knowledge with the software and the equipment. I've used texture analyzers from Texture Technologies for over 11 years in my work with ADM, and it never ceases to amaze me all the different things and methods that the instrument can be utilized for. In this video, we are going to focus on shelf life and texture information as a tool in evaluating shelf life to support formulating in product development and research. Okay, so what we saw there is known as a three-point bend rig. And the process is a method known as biscuit bend or break. We are now going to take a look at some graphs that are generated when this is performed. The instrument senses contact with the cookie and can at that point calculate from the probe starting point what the thickness of the cookie is. The pressure to bend or break the cookie is then measured. The bend is from the time of contact until peak force is achieved and the cookie breaks. In this review, we are looking at hard, chemically leavened sugar cookies. Here we're displaying a graph of the uh, hard sugar cookies um, looking at day one, day three, day 10, uh, day seven as well, and day 14. And as you can see, the one on the far right is day 14. So it's gone down slightly in hardness, but also why this peak is so far to the right is that it bends more before it starts to break. So it's lost some of its snap. And so we can see that clearly in this graph. The previous graph I displayed, day one, 3, 7, 10, and 14 of the control cookies for you. Here I have selected only the experiment set of cookie where 50% of the wheat flour has been replaced with cornstarch. Even clearer you can see that the starch cookie is by comparison very tender. Less than 1800 grams of pressure was required to break them, whereas the control were over 4500 grams. 
In the next slide, I'm going to briefly display a selection of day 1 and day 14 from each of the control, starch replacement, and sugar reduction. The black line is control day 1 and the blue line is control day 14, as we have viewed previously. The cookies are losing snap and taking longer to break, therefore bending before breaking. You can see the red and green lines are the shortest. These are the tender starch cookies. The light blue and fuchsia are the 25% sugar replacement with soluble corn fiber maltodextrin. While these are less hard to start with, they also do not bend more over time. If we are to display all of the texture chests for these cookies together, you can see it as a jumble of lines that are hard to tell apart. There are over 90 tests that are collected here together, six from each test group at each of the shelf life intervals. Here I have selected to view only the texture tests on day 14 and grouped the tests by color. It provides more clarity, but still some bunching up. There seems to be only one outlier that bent almost three seconds before breaking, and I'll remove that from view. At the same time, I have zoomed in on the graph to see more detail. Now we can see the groupings of the tests better. Two more graph slides for you. First, looking at a comparison of a control graph versus a 50% starch cookie graph line. Next, adding in the sugar reduction line. These are approximately averages I quickly chose from the groups. You can also use the software to generate averages for you as well. Well, what about the numbers? Yes, there is a results table for all of the data generated. Here you can see a macro was created to record the maximum force, the thickness of the cookie, the distance until it breaks, and if there was fracturing, how many peaks. Looking at a lot of numbers is dizzying. You could see in the results table that the average's standard deviation and the coefficient of variation are all calculated by the software. A chart wizard allows one to easily select the data to display in another chart format like a basic bar graph, for example. These simple three sets of experiments over 14 days demonstrate the challenges and opportunities in formulating for different objectives. Gluten-free with only starch could be extremely tender, Therefore, other binding protein ingredients may be needed to manage texture. Similarly, reducing sugar with a replacement like maltodextrin may improve shelf life for crispness and the cookie will be a little less hard than with 100% sugar. By being able to perform texture analysis, these observations are no longer subjective. The data provides factual clarity versus perception. Now, going back to the bread where we saw the setup do two penetrations. This obviously is different than cookie hardness to break. The basic procedure is referred to as a TPA, which we use as an acronym for texture profile analysis. Depending on the material being tested, the test is configured for the probe to penetrate a set distance or a set amount of strain. For the bread, we commonly use distance. The probe is sensitive enough to detect that it has made contact with the surface of the bread and then penetrates to the set distance at a set speed. The probe returns to rest for a set time and then repeats the process one more time. This time the probe can again sense when it makes contact and calculates and records the difference in distance from the original contact of the first penetration. This allows the software to calculate the springiness and together 
with the remaining data points from the first and second penetrations also calculates the chewiness and gumminess of the bread. Once again, we have a lot of data in our results table, as well as the graphs that are all saved individually. When we speak of shelf life and keep texture within the focus of that conversation, we can again collect factual data to see the effects and differences. For this test, I prepared white pan breads, a control set using the sponge and dough method of a four hour sponge, a test using the direct straight dough method, and a test with the addition of liquid lecithin in the sponge and dough method. For this video, I will show you the results from day 14 of the tests to see the differences. First, we will briefly review the adhesiveness, resilience, and springiness. These are calculated by the software based on the change in distance between first and second penetration, as well as the difference in force on the second penetration. In these samples, there isn't a distinct variation on these areas. In this chart, I have separated out the springiness only as a bar chart, where you can see the difference is only slightly more than 6% for the straight time batch. Here in this bar chart, we can see clearly the summary of the averages from the data for firmness of the breads after 14 days. The lecithin in the sponge and dough method clearly provided improvement and is less firm than the control. Now the blue bar on the right is the straight time dough, which is the softest after 14 days. If you have ever tuned in to Bakerpedia seminars and or other discussions on bread shelf life, you've often heard us speak about the benefits of sponge and dough. Then why is the straight time softer? I omitted a little detail to get your attention. What was also done to demonstrate the importance of fermentation and taking the time to do it all correctly is that with both sponge and dough tests, the bulk fermentation was skipped. Now we can see that even if we invest in the four hour sponge pre-ferment, we cannot skip over the bulk fermentation or it will shorten the shelf life in terms of the softness of the crumb. It's my hope that you have found this interesting and informative. Evaluating shelf life effects of starch retrogradation Moisture loss, moisture absorption, and migration is much easier and clearer to define with a texture analyzer instrument. I have more examples of shelf life and some straightforward product comparisons too. These will be presented in future Bakerpedia vlogs. Our aim is to help you as bakers be aware of and understand the tools available to discuss various shelf life or product characteristic parameters with your customers and suppliers. My thanks and gratitude to Texture Technologies Corporation for their support as well as enthusiastic inspiration to make this possible. I'm Mark Florka, your Baked and Science podcast host, and I'm a Bakerpedia influencer. <laughs> Take good care and happy baking.